going on YouTube culture dog back with another video and we're back in the world of laser discs what more can I possibly talk about you ask well we've gone through my collection of laser discs behind me I've gone through my box sets uh, all my players all sorts of stuff including a lot of spotlight videos more to come also by the way don't worry but one thing I've been hearing from people uh, throughout this entire kind of crazy ride I've been on since starting my channel last year is uh, that people are interested in, in the basics of Laserdisc. Uh, there's tons of acronyms thrown around. There's lots of information that's tossed around online as if everybody has the same kind of base knowledge of um, you know what's going on. And, and I've been hearing a lot of talk about let, let's get you know everything out on the table. You know, what's this mean? How do I do this? And you know, Laserdisc isn't quite as plug and play as a DVD. If you want to listen to DTS and Dolby Digital and all this stuff, you're going to need to look for a specific player. You might have to get some uh, strange external equipment, etc. So I figured, let's do it. Let's start from the beginning. Let's go down the line. So I'm going to talk about today the history a little bit and then work our way into what all the weird terminology we talk about. Us Laserdisc enthusiasts talk about what all that means. And they get into the specifics of all the audio formats, uh, the video, what sets Laserdisc apart, and then uh, where you can find it, where some great uh, resources, and uh, then some bits about the maintenance and upkeep because, you know, it is a dead format. So you got to give it a little bit of uh, tender love and care to keep it up and running until at least those 3D printers start making awesome Laserdisc player replacement parts. Uh, but we're going to start with a little bit of a history lesson on Laserdisc. And... A lot of this information can be gleaned. I think a lot of it's probably reprinted on the internet, but there's a great series of historical articles in this classic Laser Magic 1998 Monster Behemoth Compendium from Widescreen Review. It's got a great article called uh, World on a Silver Platter by David Robert Chalitti, uh, kind of going into the crazy behind-the-scenes world of Laserdisc and, and where it came from. And until this point... In you know 1998 or so, there had been a lot of contention over who the inventor of Laserdisc was, or uh, what company created Laserdisc, like where it all came from. And CD, uh, being another optical disc format, got lumped in together there. Philips, uh, the manufacturer, uh, took a lot of credit for it, and they were the, the inventor of CD and whatnot. So... Uh, this uh, material that came to light and was pretty fascinating, and it all kind of started oddly with Bing Crosby of all people, and there's some also some German engineers, and that more on that later though. Uh, but there was a ex Army Corps engineer named uh, Jack Mullen who was looking for um, people to help or invest or and otherwise get involved with uh, magnetic audio tape recorders, and he ran into Frank Healy, who was an agent for Bing Crosby. And Bing Crosby at this time had a radio show, and he was notorious for ad-libbing and using, you know, ribald commentary, and so much so that they couldn't run live, and he didn't he didn't like that anyway. So they would record his stuff on uh, schlacked discs, and then later kind of edit painstakingly around all his ad-libs and all the crazy stuff. Um... So Bing Crosby Enterprises was created because, hey, cool, this, this whole new uh, audio recording on tape sounded great. So they uh, all teamed up together and uh, formed this company and ran with it. And then later, yeah, this uh, being in the 50s, uh, started to get interested in video recording on tape. And that was, that was a hot kind of concept going on at the time. So these guys all had their hearts and minds set on videotaping an ultimate goal. And there was another company named Ampex, so this kind of industry leader. They were taken off in the world of videotape, especially in the 60s. Uh, and it looked like there was no stopping them. So Bing Crosby and everybody said, you know, we're beat. Let's just get out of this game. Uh, they had been using 3M, the company for uh, tape supplies, and then they ended up just selling the company to 3M. Uh, 3M already had their uh, headquarter facility, so they renamed the Bing Crosby Enterprises Group as Mincom, so a 3M Mincom. So 3M Mincom had four projects going on, A, B, C, and D. It's like that uh, old uh, Prisoner episode, A, B, and C. Except this one had D, the wild card, and D was a project called the Video Disc Project. So now we get to flash back a little bit, catch back up, because the Video Disc Project is very much tied into the gentleman who is now considered the father of the optical disc, 
this dude named David Paul Gregg. David Paul Gregg used to work at Ampex and, and a number of places, including West Tracks, a company he was working at. And it was during his tenure there that he encountered some information crossing his desk about these German uh, engineers that had been recording um, like microscopic information on you know, material the size of a pinhead. Um, and it was like intermittent lines and, and you know, dashes. And David Paul Gregg apparently said, what if we could use an electron beam? Of course, you know, lasers as we know it now were far off at the time. So he was very dismissive about lasers and still kind of was at the time of uh, the interview with him that I had read in 1998. Um, but he wanted to use a, an electron beam to, uh, instead of just having a bunch of random you know, lines in a row, he was thinking about uh, videotape, which used uh, you know, pulse code modulated FM signal. So basically, if you add like an FM wavelength, uh, like something you'd hear your radio on, you can have information coded into it. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing because, I mean, I'm not really that much of a scientific guy or anything like that. The amount of information that's in LaserDisc uh, is... And, and the technology that's used to do it is, is crazy. It's, it's amazing that it was able to be, you know, conceived when it was and put on market when it was, even though it was put on market a little too early, as we'll find out later. But, you know, the concept is similar to, uh, you know, what, what's used with CD. It's, it's little pits and lands. So there'll just be like uh, a line that, you know, falls in and then comes back out and falls in, but they're not always the same. It's not like a off and on kind of situation. There'll be a, a wide one and a thinner one and a tiny one. And basically this forces whatever it's reading it, maybe a laser to kind of recreate a, uh, a wavelength. And not only could you put video on it, but you could also code audio in there and then later in the years of of uh, lasers even though it was an analog format you could encode digital information within that fm uh you know modulated signal so you could have 5.1 full bandwidth surround it's crazy to think about so but this guy david paul Gregg, did think about it because he saw that information uh, across his desk, and they thought, what if it wasn't just a bunch of straight lines? What if it was a spiraling line, where it was just all one big line? You could fit, according to him, a couple reels of a movie on a side of a disc. Originally, it was going to be a transparent disc. It was going to be shiny and reflective, like you know CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays, etc. are. And it was going to use an electron beam to kind of carve the master disc, and then it was going to use fiber optics and a mercury arc lamp to read it, and... and, and so it was going to be a little bit of complexity, and he was looking forward to making a reality, but nobody was interested in it. And uh, eventually he got uh, let go from Westrax, apparently from I don't know, just spending too much time overseas or kind of abandoning his job or whatever. And when he came back, after his period at Westrax was over, uh, his buddy Chuck Tobias, who he'd worked with, a colleague, uh, was now working at 3M Mincom and introduced him to uh, Frank Healy, the gentleman who had previously been the uh, assistant or agent to um, Bing Crosby. And he introduced David Paul Gregg notoriously as Mr. Video Disc. And that was uh, David Paul Gregg's kind of original intent for the disc was to be called Video Disc or VD for short. And um, 3M actually let him run with it. And that was uh, experiment or project D. So he was doing a little bit of research into it and eventually had patents uh, that he was partial author for. Up until this point, a lot of this information he had been kind of culling together and coming up with it was all just stored in his head. And he didn't have any paperwork and oftentimes he would show it to people and they'd want to see some sort of report on it and he would, yeah, you know, he didn't have that. It was just all in his head and he was very protective of his property. Yeah, apparently Greg only lasted about three months or so at 3M Mancom. Uh, Stanford Research Institute was uh, brought into the project and without uh, David Paul Gregg's knowledge and they were asked to to do some research on it and eventually uh, kind of you know handed the reins to coming up with how it would work and uh, David Paul Gregg just quit the company some, some people say he snuck in on a weekend and just cleared his desk out and left meanwhile Chuck Tobias uh, who had mentioned earlier 
and a number of other 3M employees kind of formed their own corporation called Winston Research. And some people say that it was just for videotape research, and David Paul Gregg, of course, says it was for video disc research. Either way, he joined that fold, and they started to you know, take things a little bit more seriously again. It was a short period because 3M found out that all these ex-employees were all kind of bundled together doing the same kind of work they had been doing under 3M's banner, and then pretty much immediately sued, and was kind of a progenitor for the, the whole concept of that, like, intellectual property, or that, you know, you can't just, like, up and run somewhere and, and take a lot of information uh, from where you're working, <laughs> just, you know, use it somewhere else. Um, but uh, one of the key elements was that... Um, David Paul Gregg met a gentleman named uh, Keith Johnson. He used to work at Ampex uh, back in the day, and he eventually formed a, a company called Gauss Electrophysics with him. And Gauss was kind of you know, David Paul Gregg's baby. That was his uh, realm to develop the, the laser disc or the video disc and run with it. And he would take it to everybody and, and, and talk about it and it kept getting shot down. Uh, he had... He was very um, successful at that time uh, doing a lot of uh, tape-based uh, work, and his uh, tape stuff was you know, amazing and very uh, um, accurate and, and fast, and everybody loved it. So he figured at the same time he'd piggyback a lot of interest into this uh, video disc project of his. And uh, so, so a lot of his um, you know, clients or people that he knew, like um, uh, Capitol Records, uh, were you know, not interested. I believe GE got involved for a little bit, and then that kind of fell apart. And um, was just looking for a partner. At the same time, apparently 3M was still kind of developing their own uh, video disc uh, still. And uh, after David Paul Gregg went to visit Philips, and they said, no, that's a horrible idea. They immediately started trying to work on their own video disc, which is yeah, pretty cheesy. Meanwhile, one of the private investigators in Gauss uh, was a gentleman named uh, Tim Scott. And he knew uh, Don Wynn the private assistant to Lou Wasserman, who headed MCA, which was also known as the Octopus. It was just this media, you know, m empire that had its fingers or tentacles in every angle of uh, business. And, yeah, it was kind of on uh, the uh, radar for antitrust kind of government agencies for a while as being a monopoly. Uh, but definitely somebody with that you'd want to get in, into bed with on a, on a video project because they had a, a huge collection of films in their um, in their catalog that they could exploit on the home video market. Um, they eventually bought up 60% of Gauss Electrophysics in, I think, 1968 or so. Um, so there was a, a race. There was a bit of an arms race going on about videotape and video disc. And um, eventually... You know, some places like Japan were totally cool with videotape coexisting alongside video disc, and uh, America a little bit less so. Um, and they did different things. You know, the video disc format was meant to be more, you know, archival or you know the quality representation of a film, uh, whereas the videotape was meant to be more convenient and offered you know rewatchability, re uh, retaping. You know, rewatchability was actually a key factor of video discs um, benefits. But MCA, working with Gauss, uh, made everything a little bit more legitimate. MCA uh, hired a gentleman named Ken Broadbent, who uh, was asked, he was an optical specialist, asked to check out uh, their new property and uh, see what this all the hubbub was about. And he actually uh, co-authored a paper in the late 60s about this new um, you know, optical storage medium. And they actually had a floppy circular disc um, because David Paul Gregg's specs said that, you know, the tilt of the disc or whatever didn't matter the way he had designed it, unlike a rigid laser disc where if it's tilted a little bit, the, the laser won't read it correctly. But they actually had this floppy disc that they could, you know, have on this kind of like, you know, arced uh, platform. So that was uh, what they were going to go ahead and do. And they eventually did have uh, a demonstration in the early 70s, I believe, 72 or so. Meanwhile, David Paul Gregg was kind of forced to step down from Gauss, and MCA took over the whole thing and became MCA Laboratories, which eventually became Disco Vision. Which, no, it's not all about uh, disco music. It was their their name for the Laserdisc format at the time. And you, because of the research Kent Broadbent had done into um, you know what 
you know, Gauss had been putting together, he said that, you know, for the amount of money we can invest in one film, we could invest that into the research and development of this video disc project and, and make it our own and then kick back and collect royalties. Because not only could they put out their own movies because they had this huge library, they could also collect the royalty fees from other, you know, the licensing fees from anybody else who used it. So it was like the sweetest deal ever. And let's go full steam ahead was everybody's thought. And they put their labs like out in Torrance, so it was far enough that studio executives wouldn't be uh, eager to go out and visit, so they can get a lot of work done without people looking over their shoulders. And it, it must be said that a lot all this time, nobody was shown the original patents or the original work that David Paul Gregg had done. And then they were designing things a little bit differently, and that led to the um, the floppy disk uh, demonstration in '72. And they realized that they needed some help with the hardware because they had all this physical, you know, software um, media they could do. And uh, they were able to do um, copies of a master, whereas Philips was trying to do their own video disc and they could only do demos from the, the, the master itself. They hadn't actually worked the whole replication process out yet. So MCO was ahead of them in that regards, but they needed some hardware. So they actually... In the wake of you know videotape being huge, um, Sony was also working on its Betamax or, or about to. Um, RCA was going to drop Selectivision or CED, which we'll have to cover at some point because it's often called Laserdisc, even though it's just like a magnetic, like cartridge-based, you know, physical contact type, like an LP uh, medium, and uh, came out much later. But in the wake of all these competitors. Uh, it, MCA and Philips decided to team up, and Philips would handle making the players eventually under the Magnavox brand, or Magnavision, and then MCA would handle all the software, the DiscoVision disc, so it was this perfect meeting. The only problem is that just stuff wasn't ready, and the plants that they had for manufacturing the discs were not clean plants at all, <laughs> and... The discs that ended up getting uh, produced and eventually launched in 1978 in December uh, were barely ready, and, and the defect rate was, was huge. I mean, <laughs> they were just hemorrhaging money on this this project. Uh, the the plant they used used to you know make furniture, so it was loaded with sawdust particles, and I think it was 10% of the discs were like quality perfect discs. Around this time, IBM also got involved. Uh, and they joined together and created Disco Vision Associates. Uh, so it was a lot of fingers in the pie, but one of the most important fingers in the pie was Pioneer. It was actually a small company in Japan. And the main reason they got involved in the uh, you know video disc world was because they were able to create the industrial players that MCA uh, was eager to get going. And you can still get the industrial players now with the barcode scanners. They were used for a lot of education uh, purposes, too, because... You could use the the you know jump to a single frame feature to jump to another like you know piece of text or an answer for a question or something like that. Uh, so Pioneer got involved in those, and then eventually they began pressing their own discs at a plant in Kofu, Japan, which is way better than the plant in uh, California. And the discs that eventually hit the market were far different than what uh, David Paul Gregg originally envisioned. Uh, it was the same. Situation where it was a circular disc with a lot of pits and lands and just a line that was able to be read, in this case with a laser, and played back from that FM modulated you know, information that was replicated from those pits and lands. His disc was different too from it was meant to be read um, from the outside of the disc to the inside, whereas laser discs and compact discs and everything else is read from the inside of the hub all the way under the outside. Um, there was a lot of other differences, and everybody uh, that was asked about their work in the creation of video disc, laser disc, were, were you know none of them were actually told specifically about David Paul Gregg's original plans or any of his work. Um, so he did definitely kind of create the concept of optical disc, um, but didn't invent laser disc or CD the way. Um, Pioneer eventually kind of heralded him as doing. Uh, so eventually, once all these discs were you know, coming out bad, uh, MCA's catalog was was falling apart. I think the last catalog they had only had like 38 titles or whatever. It was, it was shaping up to be a bomb. And uh, Japan was still 
doing pretty well. They were interested in it. Pioneer was, you know, pressing good discs over there. And over here, you know, Betamax and VHS, all that stuff was happening. And people were really excited about recording content and being able to watch it watch it again and then re-record and then do all that kind of thing. And and uh, I was just talking with someone today about how the fact that, you know, TVs weren't even really that high quality. I, I was still using those, like, console TVs that looked like a piece of furniture. And they always had, like, the, the rounded edges. Um, so, you know, the extra quality of Laserdisc. And we'll talk about that a little bit more because it soundly trounces videotape unless we're talking about, like, DVHS or, you know, master tapes. Um, that extra bonus video quality wasn't really seen as a must-have for uh, American consumers. Whereas Jap uh, Japanese consumers were cool with, uh, you know, okay, we're going to tape this, we're going to, you know, retape that, uh, but we have this movie that we love on this great disc format, and it's high quality. So Pioneer eventually ended up stepping in and uh, picking up the pieces, and eventually it was a long time before MCA and, uh, and everyone let go of their patents. I think I, uh, IBM and MCA gave up the patents for Laserdisc in 1989 or so. Uh, but once Pioneer stepped in and took over, that's when things started getting interesting. That's, you know, after that, you know, the, the Criterion Collection discs started happening, which started paving the way for what Laserdisc would become in the 90s. So meanwhile, during all of this, David Paul Gregg was kind of lost in, in, in the shuffle. He would always claim that he was the guy that invented the optical disc, and people would, you know, basically laugh at him. Until Pioneer had the patents, and they were able to look at him. And then one of the spe specific patents, uh, the one from uh, 1968, uh, where it uh, had been, you know, kind of put together how you could make this um, this optical disc work with the pits and lands and the, at that time, transparent disc and all that stuff. Uh, but they were able to, to 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 see that this was what's been called the silver bullet. Whereas if that could be applied as you know the birth of a video disc or laser disc, it was so vague because the specifics were so different uh, that they could use it to their advantage. So it was actually more uh, in Pioneer's corner to say this is the guy they invented it because uh, it's been positioned akin to the wheel. Like if you had something roundly round and you had a patent on it, then you could just go ahead and say anything that's remotely round is based on that. So with this kind of vague thing, anything that's like remotely similar to this optical thing, it didn't have to have the exact same technical specs because CD and Laserdisc didn't have the same technical specs as the... Uh, the official patent. So then they could theoretically broaden that and anything that would come out in the future would then fall under that patent and then they would have to license uh, from Pioneer. So it was pretty smart. That And that patent was apparently lost for a long time. The word is that at the patent office, there was a guy who used to stash stuff in the ceiling for some reason and uh, a bunch of painters came in and were working on the room and then realized that there was a bunch of patents in the ceiling in which the original patent that had David Paul Gregg's name on it, uh, was found. So yeah, basically there was a guy, he came up with the concept. He didn't eventually, um, get to envision that concept himself. It was, you know, taken and worked on by a num number of other people, whether or not he would have invented laser disc with lasers or the way it was made. And, and that, or cracked all the codes that needed to be cracked to make it a viable, um, you know, marketable product, remains to be, you know, seen or is, you know, all in our imaginations. Um, but he still deserves, you know, the respect and the credit for coming up with the optical storage, you know, idea in the first place. So, Laserdisc. It's very complicated because, yeah, it was this failure from the early 80s, and it should have been a failure just like CED our RCA Select Division, which we'll talk about later, was a failure. It could have been a failure like Betamax was a failure. Um, Pioneer is really the kind of savior of the day. So whereas David Paul Gregg is the inventor of Laserdisc, Pioneer is definitely the savior of Laserdisc. And they took it from Lou Wasserman and MCA's messy mire of all these horrible discs. And, uh, and, and apparently, too, that a lot of times they would use the dead or crappy discs from... Uh, all sorts of things, including like GM training videos and stuff like that. And they would use them as uh, side, you know, blank sides. So you could, uh, and they would, you know, put some sort of coding on them. So you couldn't read them. But if you wipe them off with soap, you can still read those original old uh, training videos and stuff like that. 
In fact, you can YouTube a lot of those. Um, but yeah, that whole era just stunk of failure. But you got to give credit to the Pioneer to sticking with it and eventually seeing to fruition the whole concept of this archival medium and a library of films that would be at your beck and call in great quality. And even though you could not record on it, it still has its merits. And we're going to find out all about that. So stick with me. We're going to get into a whole bunch of information about Laserdisc, um, including all the, the terminology used in it. That's going to be up right next. And uh, hopefully by the end of this, we'll all figure out what we're talking about. Or at least hopefully I will. <laughs> but uh, thanks to everybody for uh, putting in these requests for this uh, this material and giving me the, uh, the kind of uh, gumption to go ahead and put this together and get it out as quickly as possible. Uh, so, and thanks to everybody for being patient and uh, waiting for me to get my act together and get all this stuff out there. I got a few other spotlight reviews and all that kind of stuff in the meantime to keep you entertained. But uh, hopefully you enjoyed some of the history behind the shiny format that we all know and love for a small fraction of us in the world. Know and love. Thanks for hanging out. Cheers.